Uh, my name is Charles Lee, and I'm the last person uh, of this week's activity, so I'm sure you guys are eager to get out of here, so I'll jump right in. Uh, my portfolio is called Organic Material Chemistry. This uh, portfolio is uh, emphasizing organic material. It's we, are, we are really just trying to get new properties out of uh, this material. And what we are trying to do is to push the envelope of the properties that you could get out of organic material, try to get new properties that normally not associated with organic material, and also try to uh, uh, exploit the processing, the unique processing that you can do with organic material to achieve things that otherwise would be difficult to do. Uh, my portfolio is uh, listed here in sub-areas because it is uh, properties oriented I list them as photonic material, electronic materials, and all the other properties, I group them into novel properties, and then nanotechnology. Uh, and uh, we are trying to exploit the organic material. Why are we interested in organic materials? A lot of times, the properties are not unique to organic. As a matter of fact, we are duplicating the properties of other uh, materials. But organic materials, because of the easy of processing, it allows you to do many things that uh, you cannot do with the uh, uh, traditional material. So sometimes even the properties is not as good, it enables applications that otherwise would be impossible. But a lot of times, the properties actually is better than the traditional materials. So I hope that I have uh, both types of uh, uh, description. In terms of the challenges, it really depends on what properties that you are talking about. So I have many properties in my portfolio, and each one of them have their own challenges. But in general, the challenge here is to discover new properties out of the organic material, and also how to control those properties. And also, to balance the secondary properties, this is really an important point because a lot of traditional materials, you do not, you may not have the opportunity to balance the secondary properties. What you have to do is to engineer around the secondary properties. But for the organic, you could always change the molecular structures, you could change other things. So it's a question of balancing the, the uh, secondary properties, and that's what enable a lot of the other applications. So the approach is that we want to do molecular engineering. We want to know what molecular structures will give me the properties that I want. So I'm more concerned about knowing what structure to make rather than how to make them. And processing control. A lot of times you may have the right molecules, but if you do not process them properly, you will not get the properties that you want. And because we can balance the secondary properties, it's important to know the structural properties relationship. Because a lot of time when you try to improve one properties, your secondary properties and other secondary properties may suffer. So you need to know how to do the trade-off and how to do the balance. This program, as I explained, is trying to develop the properties. It's not application specific. As a matter of fact, if I try to look at my portfolio, look at what kind of application we are got, trying to cover, there's so many of them that uh, I don't even try. But with the application in mind, it helps us guide uh, the focus of the research in terms of wh what properties what we want to achieve and what regime we want to get into. So it's not application specific, but we use the applications to guide our research. And we work a lot with the uh, labs and so forth, so they come up with a lot of uh, new concepts, new uh, application concepts. A lot of these are not real today, but we are hoping to make uh, applications, uh, materials to enable this type of new applications. Here's the uh, slide indicating the interactions. There, we are not the only one who's funding organic or poly polymer chemistry. Uh, all three services, uh, ONR, ARO, all are funding this area, NSF, NIH, and DOE. Uh, we are all addressing the same type of 
scientific issues, the synthesis, the characterization, and so forth. But among the three services, we have different focuses. So we coordinate, and uh, as a matter of fact, my counterpart from ARO is, is here. Uh, and uh, where we have overlap, we try to have joint review, for example, in the photovoltaic uh, area, both ONR and us are funding this area, so we hold annual joint uh, organic uh, photovoltaic program review. And there's also interaction with a lot of other organizations that's not doing basic research. A lot of times they still have polymer in their portfolio. It's not so much to do the polymer research, but they use the polymer for their specific applications. So we interact them, uh, uh, at, the, at that level. And especially with, a lot, with the TDs, pretty much uh, they are providing us the kind of input, what kind of properties would be of interest. And there are also other meetings to interact with uh, other agencies as well. Uh, well, go back to this slide. As a matter of fact, we get this concept from, uh, from uh, Kirkland. As a matter of fact, this is uh, what inspired the first ex uh, highlight that I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to go through all this those uh, uh, sub-areas individually. What I'm going to do is to do the highlights to illustrate what I mean by pushing the uh, properties envelopes and how we are achieving uh, things that are uh, not capable before with organic material. As I mentioned, uh, we are trying to get the uh, organic to laze uh, as, as a laser. People have achieved that already by photo pumping, but we want to electro pump it to lays because that allow you to have uh, uh, integration into flexible uh, substrate and uh, have conformal lasers and all kind of things. But there's always a, we, we we've been funding this area for a number of years. As a matter of fact, we were funding LED before organic LED or the polymer LED, but we switch that to focus to having electro pump lacing instead. But the, the, the difficulty is you have to have a certain level of excited state in your material before you can lace. And the problem is when you start injecting a larger charge into the material, then you start having loss. So if you look at this photo pump uh, situation, this is the pump pulse initially because uh, you have negligible triplet state density. Therefore, you can easily achieve the gain equal to the loss, and the lacing begins. But in organic materials, you have the triplet state. When the tri triplet state build up, then the gain decrease because of the uh, single triplet state uh, quenching, and also loss increase because the triplet state enhance the absorption into a higher excited state. As a matter of fact, a lot of uh, several programs are really dealing with the excited state, uh, and we use this fact to enhance non-needing uh, uh, absorption in our uh, 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 two-photon absorbing, uh, non-needing absorbing material. So they've gone through a lot of uh, research to understand why the lacing de decreased. So after the analysis, the conclusion is to reach the CW lacing, the continuous wave lacing. The triplet stage must reach a steady state. That is, you've got to stop the triplet stage from building up in the material. So they come up with this uh, triplet state manage, managers molecule. Actually, this is the phrase coined by the, uh, review, in the review article that address how important this uh, uh, discovery is. So, but I call it a triplet state sink, because what it does, this is the trip, uh, conventional system where you have a hose, the, the traditional four system level, where you pump into the excited state, single state, that translate into the emitters, single state, and therefore you emit. But if you build up enough density, then it will lace instead of just giving off light. But the problem with the organic is that you have triplet state. So a lot of the 
as you build up more and more density here, you're building up the density in here too. And therefore, it's cut off the, uh, because it increased the loss and so forth, it cut off the, uh, the lacing. So they call this putting in another module. The module is designed so that this excited singlet state is higher than this two, but the triplet state is lower than this two. So if you look at the emission spectrum, it follows this, uh, this sequence, and if you look at the triplet state, it follows uh, this sequence. So therefore, it acts as a sink that suck all the triplet state out of this one, and eventually you read the steady state, and therefore you have CW lacing. So they illustrated that, and indeed the photoluminescence dropped because the triplet state stopped building up, but when it reaches steady state, you have a CW lacing. So it's one's approach to how to eliminate the loss of organic material and eventually will hopefully lead to the, uh, getting, achieving the electrical pump lacing. Another area is uh, bottom-up metamaterials. One of the things that people would like to get uh, from the metamaterial is to achieve negative index uh, refraction. But for polarized light, it's the refractive, refractive, uh, refractive index is not just epsilon mu, but that's also a chirality parameter in, in there too. As a matter of fact, this chirality effect, uh, people have been building chiral structures based on metal, but those chi uh, the metal structures are inherently lossy. Therefore, it's uh, become an issue. But organic, if you can build those chiral structures out of organic, maybe it would uh, serve the purpose of getting uh, low loss material. And also, organic material, they have intrinsic uh, uh, chirality because you, if you have a chiral center in the molecule, then you could have chiral properties. So what they are trying to do is to achieve copper larger than the epsilon mu and to, to get the negative refractive index, and they are trying nanocomposite approach to enhance the chirality. And because it is organic material, you could use traditional photo patterning in order to uh, achieve chiral structure as well. So it's a two, uh, double impact on the chirality. So this is the first demonstration for organic material to have a plasmonic enhancement. So this is the molecule with chiral center built in. It had its own chiral behavior, but it's very small. By putting in the gold nanoparticles, you're using the plasmonic effect to enhance the chiralities. Uh, we always think of the plasmonic effect is to enhance the field effect, but this is not a field effect because it's just by the rotation of the chir uh, chiral center. So this is the first time it's demonstrated that, and after its uh, pub pub uh, publication in the first uh, year, it's been cited uh, 13 times. So this demonstrated the plasmonic effect. They also demonstrated excitonic effect, that is using quantum dots to enhance the chirality. The quantum dots, uh, the exciton energy level, could influence the homo lumo of the organic materials, and therefore they achieve an enhancement in the chirality as well. And here's an example where uh, I usually try to pick an example of why processing is important. So based on the polymer, the chiral polymer, you, we mix it with SU8. SU8 is a traditional the photoresist materials that allow you to do uh, photo patterning. So after they mix it, cast it, and then put on a mask, do the UV uh, uh, irradiation to uh, do the uh, pho uh, photolithography, and then they develop it by washing off the unexposed area and leave you with the chiral pattern. So what's surprising is this, is that actually after you do this, the polymer itself has a much bigger chirality than the original cast film.
So that's show an example where the processing is important. So here's the uh, polymer and with the processing uh, show an enhancement in the chirality. And what even more surprising is that the developed area, that is the part that hasn't been irradiated, actually shows the biggest improvement in chiralities. And the indication, they are still trying to understand it, but the indication is that uh, the mixing with the SU8 and the development process actually in induce a higher order chirality in the structures and therefore enhance the chirality. And this is an application in uh, a, a, a publication in science. This is a project that we are trying to use self-assembly molecule, uh, self-assembly monolayer to control the interaction of metal with organic materials. This is important in a lot of applications like photovoltaic, like uh, 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 transistors, all in, uh, involve how to get the charges injected into the organic materials. And with this uh, approach, you could actually alter the uh, work function of the polymers to, to allow, uh, the, not the polymers, the, the metal, to allow you to use uh, other electrodes for certain applications. This, uh, the importance of this science paper has two aspects. One is it creates an environment to allow you to control regional directed chemistry. Another aspect of it is uh, allow you to in situ monitor a single molecule's stochastic switching properties in the material when it's bonded to a, a metal substrate. So essentially, this approach is to squeeze the molecule or hold the molecule in such a way that you force it to go through certain steric reaction. Otherwise, th that would be impossible. If you just take two anthracene, that is, uh, without this uh, pandage at the below, when you photoreact it, it will react in this fashion. It's called a 4-4 reaction. They will react uh, in the middle of the, uh, uh, the, the three rings. But when you add the uh, phenyl, ethyl group to it, then in solution, they will not react this way. They will react this one with the triple bond because it's energetically it's lower and also uh, 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 sterically it's easier for this two molecule to approach. This will not occur. You will not find that in the solution. So what they did is to create this self-assembly monolayer of uh, uh, thioalkane, and then at the defects or at the domain uh, uh, boundary, they insert these molecules in there. And you could also insert the disulfide molecule where you force these two parts to be side by side to begin with, so that when they deposit into the gold surface, you are actually, they are trapped by the surrounding uh, alkane group. So this, uh, go through the processing, they could uh, uh, have ways to create self-assembly monolayers uh, almost without defects, but in this process, they try to create some defects so that they can insert those molecules. And th the other aspect of it is that people have been reporting stochastic switching of those molecules attached to the, uh, to the uh, metal surface that is sometimes it's conductive, sometimes it's not conductive. But this, uh, this uh, experimental setup allowed them to monitor the single molecule switching in the uh, 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 in situ. So for a molecule, if you photoly excited it uh, with UV light, get it into the excited state, you could see that the conductivities actually increase. But then it will switch back into the uh, uh, ground state and the uh, conductivities will decrease. And also, if you force the reaction to go this way, you are breaking up the conjugation. So initially, the two molecules in themselves would be conductive, but after, they after you photoreacted, it becomes non-conductive. 
So they were able to monitor that in situ and go through a series of uh, uh, mapping uh, as a sequence of time to monitor the, uh, the uh, stochastic process. So this is not new. The stochastic process is not new. But it, this is a new tool allow you to study individual molecules. Therefore, we can do uh, structural properties relationship and see how we change, when we change the molecular structures, how it influence this process and how that would influence the performance of device based on those type of structures. And here is another first. Uh, this, is, came, this came from our uh, 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 attempt to try to separate thermal transport from electrical transport. P polymer itself is, not, is both thermally insulating and electrically insulating. People have added carbon nanotubes into the polymer, not to make the polymer conductive, but to make the whole material conductive. But when you do that, you also improve, increase the thermal conductivities. So what we want to do is to separate the two. And this is the first time that uh, showed that this material has thermal electric properties. That means it has good conducti uh, conductivities, but low thermal transport. As you can see, this is a flexible film. You could easily cut them. After you cut the strip, you could connect it to a voltmeter and display the voltage. And when you hold it on one side, you see the voltage increase. When you hold it on the other side, the voltage decrease. So it's a first demonstration of uh, thermal electric material uh, based on organic material. And it's also flexible. So theoretically, it can be a wearable thermal electric. Turns out it's important for the Air Force because a lot of time the pilot sit in the cockpit in the runway when it's get hot. And after a certain time, if they cannot take off, they have to cancel the mission. Because under thermal stress, it reduces the uh, G tolerance of the pilot. So they have to do that. So HE would be interested in having developed this as a wearable thermal electric to keep the pilot cool in the runway. So the way they do that is to come up with a composite where you start out with carbon nanotubes. But you isolate individual carbon nanotube with a uh, uh, solvent and uh, with the uh, uh, emulsion material. And part of the emulsion material is a conductive polymer. The, this conductive polymer is not, does not come in a chain, but come in a, a particles, nanoparticles. So each individual nanotube is surrounded by these conductive polymers. And then you add other polymer spheres into it, this will allow you to control the mechanical properties. That's why it's very flexible. So you could tune the composition and see how stiff you want the material. And also, you force all these carbon nanotubes to go through a narrow path in the material. And as you can see here, this is two carbon nanotubes. And it's surrounded by, by uh, conducting polymers uh, spheres, while the electrical transport can go through because you have conductive polymers surrounding it. But the mismatch of the phonon energy between the carbon nanotube and the uh, conductive polymers acts as an effective phonon scatterer. And that's why the, uh, it's still uh, thermally insulating, but electrically conducting. And it's for the first time we can separate the electric uh, conductivities and maintaining the same level of thermal conductivities. And note that this is in the, the electrical conductivities in the log scale, but this is in the linear scale. And that's why we can see the properties that we want to see. And this is based on single wall. As you know, single wall can be either conductive or can be semiconducting. But if you use double wall, then the chance is much higher that they will all be uh, conducting. And you can see that uh, using double wall, they get an 800% improvement over using just a single wall carbon nanotubes. And here's a project of using chemistry to do a graphene. We all know that graphene has very interesting properties. 
but the best electronic properties you get out of it is always very expensive, or you could get it out of the pristine graphite. So we are trying to use chemistry in order to uh, address graphene. And this is another science paper. And what it shows is that you could easily do patenting on graphene. If you have two layers and you use a mask to expose the material to sink, the part that's been exposed to sink, when you wash it with XGL, will wash off the first layer of the graphene, but it will not affect the layer underneath. So therefore, you could, after the first mask, you could always put on another mask and remove another layer. So here you have two layers because it's never been exposed to the sink. This one, because it's exposed to the sink only once. This one, you're exposed to the sink twice, and therefore it's two level deep. So they were able to uh, do patterning, so that makes it a lot easier in the future to do uh, patterning for graphene uh, to make uh, electronic. And I had talked about this last year. They, a lot of times when you try to functionalize the graphene to make it compatible with organic material, you wind up uh, destroying the electronic properties of the graphene. And they came up with an approach using uh, potassium, uh, potassium uh, vapor to unzip the carbon nanotubes, but leave it with hydrogen side group and no damage to the graphene. So you're leaving the electronic properties intact. And then after, at this point, you could replace the H group with whatever organic chemical you want, depending on the subsequent process you want to do. And they have done it with styrene, they have done it in isoprene. So it turns out this, uh, it, this material, if you have a thin graphene nanoribbon, it's practically transparent to RF wave. And they have been working with Lockheed Martin and develop a system where this is spray coatable. You could spray coat a carbon nano, uh, 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 graphene uh, 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 coating on any surface, uh, even on a flexible surface. And then there are enough conductivities that you could do it de do a de-icing. So this could be a de-icing approach for radomes, for radar, and uh, this is one example of a transition, the type of transition that we're trying to do. Uh, here's a fun part. Uh, they found that if you have a carbon, uh, copper foil and put any carbon source, any carbon source on top of it, and then put it in a uh, uh, reactive tube and flow hydrogen and argon over it, the carbon material will decompose, but a single layer of graphene, pristine graphene, will form at the bottom of the copper foil. So they have a lot of fun. They use cookies. They use chocolate. They use grass that you just get out of the yard. They use plastic, and they get carried away, use dog waste, <laughs> and use a cockroach legs, and all produce pristine graphene. So they get a lot of publicity out of it. They take <laughs> carbon uh, Girl Scout cookie and said that one box of Girl Scout cookie can convert to, <laughs> to graphene covered 30 football fields. Based on the price of the graphene now, it's worth $15 billion. So they got a lot of attention out of it. Uh, Here is another process that rely on controlling the excited state. I talked about this last year. Uh, it's a very efficient up conversion process. They can take the ordinary solar light and convert it into, uh, do the up conversion, and actually you could, it's uh, visible. You could see the up conversion uh, in here. And they, not only in solution, they have also demonstrated doing it in uh, uh, solid. So essentially, this is an approach that will allow you to alter the solar spectrum to fit whatever 
photo process you want to do. So here's an illustration of that. This is the first example of splitting water based on only up-converted light. So the, 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 the uh, splitting water with uh, tungsten, uh, tungsten oxide, the uh, peak is in the UV. So if you can block the, uh, you can use the up conversion, you convert the green into the blue that overlap with this region, therefore you could have the uh, water splitting. So they block off the light, use a filter, block off the lights from this end, and just allow the green lights to go through with the photon conversion. Actually, they split the water. And uh, so this is the first demonstration of that. And this is uh, up conversion visualized in uh, uh, photo the electrochemical cells. And you could see the bubbling. And by switching on and off, you could actually see the uh, process. But uh, if you have to use uh, the gas water, if it's aerated, then the process is not good. So uh, this is uh, more or less my last slide. Uh, we got a lot of recognitions. We got a lot of uh, uh, people getting awards in the, in, the, uh, in the program. So I'm only highlighting those that uh, we received in the, in the last year. In 2011, we have a number of PIs being elected uh, American Chemical Society fellows. Uh, one of the uh, PI at uh, UCLA is identified as one of the uh, hottest research in 2010, uh, highlighting the photovoltaic work that uh, he's been doing, organic photovoltaic work that he's been doing. This is a YIP a P case. Uh, and getting an award as a young investigator. And this is uh, Larry Dalton at University of Washington getting the Linus Pauling Award in 2011. As a matter of fact, he and Alex Jan has been the uh, force in developing the electro-optic polymers, which is this story here in the chemical and engineering news. They revisit 2000, and this technology is uh, identified as one of the uh, six highlighted discovery in, in the past decade. And as a matter of fact, uh, we are the heavy investor. Uh, uh, we, we funded this area substantially, and we're still doing it. But there's, there's still uh, issues need to be addressed. But it's always an ongoing transition in this area. So right now, our Rx and R why are uh, trying to develop a, a uh, new antenna system using metal material as well as uh, photonics for RF photonics. And in the old antenna system, you need to gather the RF signal, go through a uh, electronics and the modulator and so forth before you get, this, get the signal out. The new approach is to integrate all this onto the antenna element so that you could get the signal out directly. And the EO polymer is one of the key technologies for its development. So with that, uh, that's my summary. Uh, the program is focused on trying to get new and interesting properties out of organic material. We are not application specifics, but we, we always keep in mind what are important to the Air Force. And a lot of times, those applications may not even be uh, real today, but we need to know what properties will enable those type of applications that help us guide the, uh, the research. And here's the uh, challenges, and here are the approaches. Questions or comments? You talked about de-icing uh, of, de de of radomes or, or that possibility with graphene. So what are you saying that if the ice is on the structure and you then add graphene, the, gra uh, the ice disappears? Or no, are you... You have to run a current through it. You have the electro on the side. You can always grab the, uh, 
electrode on, uh, on each end and then run a current through it. Okay, well then that, uh, so that this would be a permanent feature of the... It could be. So how resistant, when you actually put graphene onto a structure like that, I'd be specific about aluminum magnesium, why? Because we all sit in an aircraft while it is being de-iced. Uh, and is this, uh, would, would this be something that would actually resist airflow friction, et cetera? I'm just going beyond the concept of putting it in a static situation for uh, a situation on an aircraft wing. On aircraft wings? Yeah. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, uh, this could, you, you could tailor this to be transparent also. I didn't talk about the transparent electro part. People are talking about replacing the ITO in the cockpit. So you could put it on a wing for the icing purposes. Uh, so there are many applications. I'm just mentioning one, but there are many other applications. Is, is there any work moving forward in this type of application area? The well, transition is what I'm referring to. I don't know that because those are, maybe companies are doing that, not in my program. Because my program don't address those applications. We're just only enabling whatever technology they want to do. Great. If there are no other questions, let's uh, thank our speaker again.